So um, at the beginning, we had just fixed workstations with high computational power, and they were mostly stationary or less mobile. And um, today, we're facing low power devices with high mobility and high connectivity to each other. And so computations can often not performed on those devices anymore. So computations are today mostly forwarded into the cloud, which is mostly sufficient. So um, when you see your mobile phone, and if you take a picture, Google will upload it um, to their cloud and will analyze it and um, try to improve the picture and all this whole stuff. In some cases where you need, for example, um, low latency, edge computing might be a better solution. And um, as the devices itself changed, also the network changed. So at the beginning, we had just um, devices connecting to each other. For example, you connected your workstation to another workstation or to a printer and so on. But um, today, mostly people are trusting data instead of machines. So if you want to watch a YouTube video, you're not interested from which machine it comes. You're just interested in the file you want to receive. And that's what information-centric networking is about. So we address this data by their name, and we name each data object like in the network, like you name a file on your hard disk. So if you want to request one data object, you send a kind of interest message and say, OK, I want to get this YouTube video. And the network will just deliver it um, from the network from any possible location. And um, by having this location independent nodes, your router could also cache data that are often requested in a special region. So that's kind of content delivery networking inside the network. So let's make a small example to this. For example, we have here a client computer. And the client com computer wants to request some data. So this data object are stored on some cloud servers somewhere in the network. The client says, I want to get this data. And um, one of those nodes will deliver the data to the client. So the forwarding in ICN um, works mostly like you have a forwarding table that um, stores a prefix. And for example, if this client now requests an um, interest that starts with sample, this node will decide, OK, so how to sample goes this direction. And then it will find the file sample test file that it requested. But um, requesting data objects is just a special case of requesting results. And so what we in Basel did was saying, OK, we want to fetch the result from the network. Because in cloud scenarios, usually your data are stored inside the cloud. And you want to compute something out of this data. And you don't want to first download the data and then do the computation. And Moreover, we want to keep this key property of ICN where the location can be chosen by the network. So as before, we had data coming from any location inside the network. Now we want to find the best location to compute a result. And for cloud scenarios, this location is often where the data are stored. Because you face large input data sets and small function code, like MapReduce operations, and um, usually the result is smaller than the input data because you compute something out of the data. And so we move the function code to the data and try to compute the results there. So for example, we have here a function code that calls func on the da object data. And we can retransform this function object so we have data, and then func, and here's a placeholder where this is later inserted. And this way, using this longest prefix matching that was applied here, 
we will end up forwarding this interest to a node that stores this data and then it will start the computation. So here's a small illustration. We have a scenario where we have a client, some nodes in the middle, and somewhere a cloud center. And usually the computational power is increasing towards the cloud. Now, sending the request func data, we would end up at the function where it's possible to compute the result or we transform it and prepend this data and so we can compute on the node where the data are stored. So now we come to an IoT scenario and the data are now often from sensors, from any kind of IoT devices that sit on the client side. And the data are now produced on this side and not from the cloud anymore. So we have now the possibility to co um, tra transport the data into the cloud, which might not be sufficient when millions of sensor devices do this. Or we compute local, which also may not be sufficient because the IoT nodes usually have just low computational abilities. So the best way would be to compute on an edge computing node. But with our forwarding strategy, either going to the function or to the data, we will never end up here. Um, but um, nevertheless, we thought, OK, we, we are able to compute location independent, so there must be a way to compute on a node in the middle, on an edge, on a fog computing node. And therefore, we just added a prefix to the forwarding tables. That's just like edge node for every node in a region that can perform computations at the edge. This way, we are possible, well, it was possible to compute now at the location where we wanted to compute. Because using this prefix in front of the computation, it will be forwarded to an edge computing node. And the edge computing node then take, takes the responsibility to compute the result. So what the very nice thing about all kind of information-centric networking is um, it supports client-side mobility directly, so you don't have to care about it. It just will directly work. And um, NFN can compute on any location inside the network. So NFN is this name function, what we created. Um, so this um, is also not just static IoT scenario, but also very highly mo um, mobile scenarios like um, autonomous car scenarios. Um, and people from Bosch, that's a German company producing um, parts for cars, like electronic for cars and so on, they were creating something that was called electronic horizon. And, um, they said they want to have a virtual sensor data map, like Google is already doing on Google Maps, because Google Maps shows you the traffic conditions, but they want to do it more fine quite way, so that um, that you can um, that you know if the next traffic light, for example, is green or red, and if it's red, you may reduce your speed before you see it, so that you will get it when it's green. And so you don't have to stop completely, which will save you some gas. And it will also give you information about the road conditions or about um, navigation um, to avoid some traffic jams. And um, another scenario would be um, to have completely autonomous cars that have to communicate to each other, or they want to communicate to each other, so that you can, um, they can drive very close to each other, so you can increase the capacity of the roads. 
So here we have an example from an electronic horizon. So we have here a car driving, the car connects to um, some base stations, we call them roadside units, along the street. And um, from those roadside units, it can receive information about those electronic horizons. For example, here's a speed limit, or um, here is um, a construction area. So that's simple stuff you can directly, or you can also get from Google Maps. But there are also other stuff like you have um, road slipperies, or um, you have here a traffic jam directly, or just a single car stopping. And those um, have, um, for those um, kind of scenarios, the reaction time between the car and the roadside unit have to be very fast, so you don't want to send everything up to some cloud computing mode. So, the challenges um, here, on, and you cannot compute on the car itself, it would increase the gas con um, amount that you require for driving a lot because you would require really high computational power for that. Um, so, um, because you need this high computational power and this fast reaction time, edge computing seems to be very sufficient. Um, but, when this car sends a request to this roadside unit asking what about the road conditions here, for example. And um, this roadside unit has to compute the result. In the meantime, this cars continue driving. And when the result is finished here, the car is not reachable anymore. In this case, um, we need some way that the car can get the result from another roadside unit, because sending the same request to the next roadside unit might not be sufficient because the car will lose the connection again. So, to handle this electronic horizon scenario, we thought we use the location independency of NFN to compute a result, we issue an interest message towards one outside unit and directly start computing and looking if the previous outside units already computed the result or part of the result. And if a previous outside unit already computed a result, we patch this result and deliver it <coughs> to the car directly. And, and Further optimization is we pull the, um, if the computation did not finish, we pull the running computation to the next roadside unit. So the car starts the computation here, when the car asks here, is the result finished? The computation will be pulled towards this roadside unit. And if it's finally here the result can be received, so it's not so far to transport. So you maintain this quick reaction time you require. So here's this is an example again. The car is connected to this node and issues a request and the data are produced by the car. So the car has a sensoric to or some of the data and some of the data are produced by a previous car. And now the car continues driving. You start the computation also on this node and look if this computation is finished or at least if you can get an intermediate result, so a particular result from the previous node. So to end up, um, we had um, seen that um, we started NFN building for just cloud scenarios, and when we met the people from Bosch, we realized, okay, um, in some parts, it, um, or some scenarios, you need really scenario-dependent handling of computations inside a network. And, and um, NFN offers just an in work 
um, a location independent workflow how to describe a computation and um, by just changing the forwarding strategy and keeping the workflow definition we can use this workflow definitions for um, cloud and for edge scenarios and we can also use it for highly mobile scenarios but um, up to this point we have only one or the other um, for future work we think about something that we can compute some part on the edge and push computations that are more in, in, or that requires more computational power towards the cloud where this computation can be faster resolved okay so um, that was a bit quicker now since we lost some time at the beginning but um, yeah it's a bit yeah so thank you